All right, so my job in this is to, we're gonna kind of lay some foundational um, pillars, I guess, and um, we will get back to both Matt's ministry. So um, one of the things that we're just now getting coming back to us is a little bit of the first research on just what has happened in congregations, you know, because of COVID. So this was the first study that we got uh, that came back. It was in from November from Hartford. And you know, one of the things that we know, this is all stuff that you've already witnessed, right? Um, four out of five churches are now hybrid. They have continued the online option, even if they're back in person. Um, more than half have discontinued um, at least some fellowship events. Um, I see you nodding. This happens every time I talk about this, right? People are just like, yeah, that's me. That's me. Um, uh, total church attendance is about 12% down. Now, people see that a lot of times, and, and actually the LifeWay statistics that I'll show you in a second um, are only 6% down. What we're learning is that that is across the board, both hybrid or both online and um, in person. The in person attendance is still way down. Um, but um, one of the things that's most interesting is that during the pandemic, before the pandemic, about 40% of your parishioners would be volunteering in some way. After, now, it's like 19%. That's a radical drop in human capital that we offer at a time when needs for the kinds of things that church offers have really escalated. Um, and um, two thirds, more than two thirds of clergy have considered leaving ministry at least once. Many of them have actually done it. Um, a few of them say very often, and two thirds of them say this was my hardest year of ministry. My question for the other third is, well, if this wasn't, what was, you know? Um, so, yeah, in, uh, this is the, uh, the Lifeway study on church attendance that um, they were, it came out just not too long ago, but they were looking at figures from last August. And so you can see sort of how that breaks down in terms of most people um, were experiencing, you know, a drop of about half at that point. And African American congregations were really hard hit, you know. So um, interesting things happened also is, um, in the pandemic in terms of what we know about young people. Now, for those of you who are actively in youth ministry, which I think is everybody in this room, None of this is a surprise. You're like, yeah, well, that was happening before the pandemic, right? But it's one of those things where the pandemic was like an x-ray of things that were already going on, but now we see them much more clearly. Um, <clears throat> and the largest challenge facing um, kids was mental health. Um, three out of four say that spiritual practices actually positively impact their mental health. Um, by the way, this research comes from Springtide. Um, if you are not on their mailing list, they are a wealth of resources. Um, I suggest getting on their mailing list. And they have these research reports from time to time that are free to download. Um, of course, young people's disinterest in religion, we know about this from the nuns and the duns, we're coming back to that in a second, um, got more accentuated during the pandemic. Frankly, so did their parents. Um, and the number of people who never attend, number of kids who never attend religious services um, increased 14%. Um, interestingly, though, most of them say they started a new, um, well, yeah, I actually don't have the statistic of how many most is, but it's um, more than 51%, it's like 70%, I think. Um, started a new spiritual practice during the pandemic in some way. And a lot of this was um, a form of self-medication for anxiety, right? 51% um, say it's prayer, um, that that's what they started. All right, so, the long and the short of it is we had, we are now sort of coming out of a period of shipwreck, you know? And <laughs> there's no getting ready for it. I actually think this is gonna wind up being good news for the church because stuff we would have squawked about for 20 years, we just had to do, you know? But anyway, you know, um, shipwreck is not something that is new to people who read scripture. Can you read that well enough? Carolyn, could you read that for us? Thanks. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay or the beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. So they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, but the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out the plan. 
He ordered those who could swim to, the, to swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Okay, so this has become kind of a guiding passage for me over the last um, two or three years. And back to that Flotsam and Jetsam thing, you know, if you watch Little Mermaid, the eels are named Flotsam and Jetsam. And you know the, the technical <laughs> definitions for those. So Jetsam is the stuff that you throw overboard to stay afloat. Church did a lot of that. We had plenty of Jetsam. But we also have a lot of Flotsam floating around, right? And the, thing, the church, the ship breaks apart, the pieces that you grab onto. Now, what's really interesting is notice in that passage, it was the broke the parts of the ship that broke apart, the ship that sunk, that was the means of salvation. It got them to shore. No one drowned, right? H. Richard Niebuhr talks about um, shipwreck as those kind of life, I'm paraphrasing here, but life experiences where the thing that you thought would hold falls apart. And of course, young people have lots of experiences of shipwreck um, without a pandemic. Um, one of the most common that churches are notoriously bad at acknowledging is this when their parents split up, right? The very foundation of their existence, just the floor just falls out from underneath of them. And our typical response to that is to, to actually not call attention to it because we don't want to make it worse, you know? It's all well intended, but the way young people experience that is you have absolutely no idea what my life is like. So there are some things in that passage that I think are worth um, paying attention. One is the thing that fell apart. The Ark of Salvation is what um, an ancient term for the church. Um, the, the word, you know, it, when Christianity was illegal, um, the early Christians would call it the nave, the navis in Latin, which is where we get the nave of the, ch of the church architecture. Anyway, it mean, means um, boat, ship. Um, the boat that fell apart was the thing that got them to shore safely. So that's number one. Um, the second thing is, the text, if you read further in that story, it's a long story, but it's really worth, you can get a million miles out of this passage. So they wind up, where they are washed ashore, they have no earthly idea where they are, right? So the people, and they're met immediately by, the natives are very friendly and very curious, and they tell them they're on Malta. So... I think we are all on Malta right now because Paul and his, his shipwrecked, soaked compadres have zero idea where is Malta, what is it, what's happening here, who are these people, you know, blah, blah, blah. These people have absolutely no idea who they are. They don't care where they, they don't care what they believe. They don't really care how they do things. But they're curious about them. But what they really want to know is, wait a minute, how did you get to shore? What happened? Your God did what? You know. So they're curious, but they don't know or care about anything that would have been held dear culturally to the people who were on that ship. So again, here's an analogy, right? We are on an unknown shore. I, we are all doing ministry in Malta right now. And we don't know who the people are. We are ministering to people we've never seen before, never talked to before, largely because we are less tied to our church programs than we used to be. Funny how that lets us hear things and notice people that we didn't notice before that have been there all along. These people aren't hostile to what the church is about. They don't get it. They don't care about our piety, our polity. They don't care about what, whether the United Methodist Church, I don't know if this is falling apart or not, we are. And they don't care. Doesn't matter. But they're curious. Wait a minute. How did you get here again? That's interesting. Tell me about that story. So we got to figure out how to do ministry in this unknown place that we find ourselves. It would have been way easier if Malta had found us <laughs> than to go through a shipwreck to do it. But here we are. Okay. The other thing I think is really interesting about this is that, you know, Malta actually... Um, it's a very Catholic island today, and um, Paul is the patron saint of Malta. He's credited with bringing salvation to Malta in the, um, the language of the Catholic Church, and they have these festivals every year that commemorate the shipwreck. Anyway, I think it's fascinating that they credit Paul with saving Malta, because in this story, Malta saves Paul, right? And I just wonder whether this this 
weird place that God has brought us safely to shore on. This, this place of disintegration, this place where everything is disoriented and we feel like we don't know the terrain at all. I wonder if the God's, if this shipwreck is what God uses to save the church. You know, we've had to let go of a whole lot of stuff that was going to be really hard for us to let go of. But guess what? Here we are. All right. So, all right. In every COVID-shaped ministry job description, uh, I have learned to say COVID-shaped rather than post-COVID because, you know, I just had it two weeks ago. So we're not post it yet. Um, all of us are having to do three things. Number one, we've got to come to terms with shipwreck. Number two, we've got to make sense of this new landscape. And number three, we've got to figure out how to rebuild the boat. So what you, people like Matt have already been doing this for a while, and we are their students at this point. Now, part of this is we've got to complexify the research that we are working with. We have gotten accustomed to thinking about you know, people abandoning church as the shipwreck. Nuns and duns, for example, a third of, it's actually a little more than, um, now a third of Americans under the age 30 have no religious affiliation, okay? There's an article not too long ago that also added the ums to the nuns, duns, and the ums. The ums, so the nuns are people with no religious affiliation. The duns are people who still have faith, but they're done with church, completely just burned out on it. And I cannot tell you the number of pastors that fall into that boat. I mean, it's really astonishing to me. I have a, a number of friends who are retiring to llama farms, goat farms, vineyards. I'm like, I said to my husband, is there a goat farm in our future? And he's like, not with me, there's not. Um, <laughs> the ums are people who are still kind of there, but it just doesn't really matter anymore. They're, dis they're disillusioned, they're discouraged, and they're kind of depressed about what, what they thought being part of a church would be like. Anyway, so the question is, uh, is this really what's causing the shipwreck? I'm going to say no. I think we've got some more fundamental things at stake. And of course, these were happening before the pandemic, but they're really, they've been x-rayed now in ways that we know. So Springtime found um, kind of two themes in their research. One was how young, adult, or young people were feeling. Um, a third of them are hopeful, just as many are uncertain. That word kept coming up, uncertain. I don't know what I think about this, right? Um, a number of them feel isolated and trapped, which is, of course, part of the route to the mental health crisis. And I don't know if you've been reading the um, statistics lately, suicide spikes. Mental health among young people is in a place that, I, I mean, I'm in, in ministry, youth ministry for my entire career, and I'm 62. And it's like, I've never seen numbers like this in terms of, um, young people, mental health, and self-harm. In many ways, this is becoming the key um, good that churches can offer young people in communities. Um, it's one of the reasons why schools are not turning us away in the way that they once did, because their kids are in crisis, and they need communities to come around side them in any way they can. Um, so we have to, we have to begin to either get good at it ourselves or begin to assimilate or accumulate resources to address this. So for young people, mental health is the shipwreck of our time. And the question is, is the church capable of holding them as the, their foundations, that thing, that, that thing that they thought would hold as it lets go, okay? So that's, that's a job that we have to start making sure is like front and center. But the other thing that was interesting in the Springtide research was what has happened in young people's faith? Because of course we've got this background of nuns, nuns, and now ums um, that says that, yeah, well, they're all leaving, and so, you know, the, the ship has fallen apart. What, we are, what Springtide said was young people's faith isn't exactly absent. It's not quite true that they're nuns, right? What's happening is their faith is unbundled, is the word that they use. And what that means is what, what being religious looks like today for young people, for our teenagers and our young adults, what being religious looks like is fundamentally changing, right? <coughs> How I 
am religious looks very different from how my parents are religious and certainly how my grandparents were religious and probably how my youth leaders are religious. Um, so the question is, is that a threat or an opportunity for the church? So if you have read any sociology on faith development, you know that the, um, I call this the religious identity cocktail. Three, three pieces are part, if, if you're trying to figure out somebody's faith, you look at belief, belong, behave. Those are the three big ones, right? And there are complex relationships between these. Some people think first you believe, so the, first you belong, then you believe, and some people say, no, first you behave, then you belong. <laughs> I mean, so that's an open thing, but, but here's what's interesting. If, in fact, those three things are part of the cocktail of religious identity, then we've, we've got to complexify this nuns stuff a little bit. Because, of course, some people are nuns because they don't believe it. Some people are not nuns because they don't act like Christians. They don't want to act like church people. Um, the Fuller Research calls that the Jesus jacket, with fresh fre freshmen in college are very likely to have to wear a Jesus jacket where they think of Christianity as behavior. This is very common in evangelical circles, right? And so, but if it's the jacket, they just take it off when they don't want to behave as Christians. So, and then I'll put it back on for Sunday morning, right? And of course, some people are, um, and, and the, the vast majority of people who are, say, are, they, they don't want to really act like Christians, as you can see. Um, maybe I'll believe, maybe I'll belong, but I just don't want to act like those people, you know? Um, and then, you know, 10% don't belong to a religious community. You put those all together and you come up with those numbers in the middle. This is a more complex way of rendering that nuns data, right? So sometimes it's how you behave, sometimes it's what, what, whether you belong to something, and sometimes, as you can see, actually not too often, it has to do with what you believe, which helps explain the, the conundrum of some of this research. You've got all these people who are nuns that say they don't belong to anything, they don't have faith, but they pray. And you're like, well, hmm, to who, to what? It could be that they're nuns, but not in the believing circle, okay? So I think Lady Gaga is a really good example of this, okay? So what's happening is these circles are, sorry, these circles are, are moving apart from each other. The intersection is becoming. So Lady Gaga, if you know anything about her, she considers herself, and by all observation seems to be, a religious human being. She is a practicing Catholic. She went to Catholic schools, Catholic parish. She's got a relationship with the, her local priest. I mean, she's, she's the real deal when it comes to going to church as a Catholic, OK? So this was how she was raised, and it matters to her. Um, so that's, let's call that her religious identity. She got that from her upbringing. Um, her religious um, practices are a little more out there, right? Yes, she prays, she worships, but, and she also schedules her tour dates based on astrological charts, right? So she's importing re, um, religious practices from all over the place, not just from her local parish, right? And then her religious beliefs also are informed by all sorts of places, not just her, her religious upbringing. Some of it is, but she says, I hope, this is just one, I just, this is a random article I thought, I hope I'm teaching people to worship themselves. Now my bet is her priest would be a little, um, sorry to hear her say that, maybe, but she is also very much part of the self-empowerment movement, right? So these, so what's happening here, okay, I got, I thought I was getting cool here. It turned out not to work quite the way I wanted it to. Anyway, these things are all falling apart. Well, hmm, I don't know what happened there. Anyway, they're all apart from each other now, right? <laughs> I can't explain all of that animation. Okay, so the question now is what is our job, right? Are it, as youth pastors, as Christian leaders, is our job to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? Are we, are we trying to bring these circles together? My, my theological training said, yes, that was our job. We want this to be an integrated kind of identity that, they, that holds together, you know? But it does make me wonder whether we have limited what that looks like. So maybe, what is all that? Maybe our job is to draw a bigger circle. There, so there might be more ways 
of embracing this new understanding of what it looks like to be a religious human than what the surveys are showing, what the National Study of Youth and Religion showed, or even what some of the springtide research shows. So anyway, if we are drawing, oh, here, I, don't, I don't know what that does. Okay. So here's a question. If the ship has already fallen apart, it kind of feels like we're a little late on the game, right? The horse is out of the barn. What are we supposed to do? How do we stop this? What, what's our, what is our job in this? So we're going to go to a second scriptural metaphor here. Um, I don't know. Who can, who can see that? What, you mind reading it? Uh, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Okay, so the first thing we know is that... Um, it looks likely that, yeah, I mean, Lazarus is clearly gravely ill, right? And Jesus ch chooses to just wait it out, right? And so the second thing that happens is, um, Peter, you want to continue? Jesus wept, so the Jews said, see how we loved him? So by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus is not only dead, but he's buried. He's in the tomb, right? He's been there for, what, three or four days. And so to the point where, you know, it worries people about the smell. And so the ship, is, the ship is broken apart. It's, the damage is done. So what is our role now in that case? And Peter, go ahead and continue the passage. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Right, so first people are looking on going, oh, this is this beautiful, tender scene, how he loved this guy, you know, they're, they're very, they're all caught up in the grief of it, and then Jesus goes crazy. <laughs> hey, Lazarus, out of there. And so, you know, what is beyond their capacity to imagine is what God does. God is the innovator here. God is doing the new thing. Not the people standing around. The state, people standing around are offering all sorts of, you know, sympathy. But God is the one providing new life. That's important for us as we talk about this innovation conversation. Very little of what we ever do is going to be new. Only God really could do the new thing. Ad novum, as Moulin talks about it. So, you know, it's, um, we, we are jumping on board with God's new thing because... Jesus is not content to let those witnesses, see the crowd, right? The crowd, they are witnesses to the power of God. They've seen it happen. They can't explain it, but it is real to them. That's the church, y'all. We can't explain what God is doing, but we have become convinced in some ways it is real. Not everybody in the pews would say that, but most of us who are leaders would say that, right? We, it's real, and we are the bystanders who are witnessing God's life-giving power at work. We have seen God's life-giving power happen in some way, and Jesus gives us a job. And so, Peter, go ahead and finish it up. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So that's the church's job. God does the innovation, we mop up, Right? God does the innovation, calls people to new life, calls young people to this new life that God has promised them. And our job is to unbind them as they stumble their way towards it. Because there are still things that are holding them back. So God is the innovator, the author of new life, but God gives us this role to play, to unbind the youth that Christ has called out of their tombs.